Коллеги, мы продолжаем. Last but not least session for this evening, and I can imagine that some of you came for the conference specifically to be part of the discussion on the Korean Peninsula. As I'm sure most of you saw in the agenda, Korean issues, Korean Peninsula issue are in the center of, of the conference agenda. And I will switch to Russian here. Дальше я буду говорить по-русски. Uh, we start our uh, final session of the day, the last but not the least. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about the situation on the Korean Peninsula. I would uh, ask the organizers to uh, get a set, a headset uh, over here. Uh, the uh, subject is extremely urgent and uh, important. We have uh, more than once that uh, it's very important uh, to have a dialogue on this matter. And I voiced my appreciation uh, to our colleagues, to a partner institute uh, in uh, DPRK, in the Institute Institute of American Studies, uh, Comrade uh, Joe Cho Su, thank you for your openness uh, for negotiations and uh, dialogue. Uh, we understand the difficult situation and the sensitive nature of the subject of the discussion. We have four uh, speakers at this session. Before I uh, pass it over to them, and uh, we expect all of them to make their introductory statement. We uh, would offer uh, them uh, seven minutes uh, to each uh, person. Let me introduce the co-chair of this session, uh, my uh, good colleague uh, from China Arms Control and Disarmament Association, uh, Mr. Li Qiang. Uh, we uh, meet uh, with uh, Mr. Li Chi Young quite regularly since the time uh, when he was appointed uh, to his current position uh, several months ago. Uh, Chi Young, it's a great pleasure. The floor first to you for some brief remarks, and after that, we will give the floor to our panelist, Deputy Foreign Minister Mark Wolf, will speak the first. Please, Chi Young. Thank you, Anton. At the outset, let me express my great appreciation to Anton for inviting me to attend the Moscow Non-Proliferation Conference. And it's also a great honor and privilege to co-chair with Anton on this very important subject. As Anton has mentioned, the importance of the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula, I have already noticed why it's so important, because I have already seen the active participation of this session, as well as a large media coverage at backstage. So my understanding is that this is very important. That's why we have to continue our dialogue and discussions on this uh, issue. And as for China's part, even though I used to work in arms control department uh, a decade before, uh, and uh, also involved in the six party talks, <laughs> for some time. And uh, as for China's role, I would say that we are willing to continue to promote the dialogue and promote the enhanced mutual trust among various partners. 
and we will continue to play a constructive role uh, in realizing a peaceful settlement of a Korean nuclear issue, peninsula nuclear issue, as well as to maintaining the peace and stabi stability of the Korean peninsula. And with that, as a very brief opening remarks, I would like to invite Deputy Vice, Min Vice Foreign Minister uh, Mogunov for opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, yes. Let me remind everyone, not everybody is here from the beginning. Uh, we are going to uh, have the press in this uh, session. So uh, this is uh, the session uh, to be uh, recorded. Everything is uh, that is said here is for the record. Uh, we are going to have this information posted on the web and it will be on uh, TV on big federal channels. This is an important edition. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by uh, saying that there are a lot of experts in this room. Uh, this is Friday night. And uh, uh, the uh, fact that we have so many people here uh, tells me that we are speaking about uh, one of the most urgent issues on the international agenda, settlement of the whole range of uh, problems on Korean Peninsula. My congratulations uh, to the organizers. A very good uh, statement uh, in the title of the session. You walked away uh, from the regular uh, formulas, uh, what has to be done and who is to blame. Uh, you are making a step further. Uh, I'm trying to uh, focus on uh, the question that you stated. What is new uh, for almost uh, two years, uh, the atmosphere on the peninsula has been uh, quiet. Uh, uh, DPRK is observing the uh, moratorium on launches. The United States and uh, Republic of Korea uh, do not uh, have military exercises. Uh, this is what all parties are interested in. As we know, on October the 5th in Stockholm, uh, a new round of uh, working negotiations has taken place. Uh, different opinions uh, exist uh, with regard to this round of negotiations, but strengthening mutual trust uh, is only possible uh, through a lot of patience in negotiations. That is one piece of news. Another piece of news, uh, implementation of a roadmap uh, for settlement of Korean uh, problem uh, developed by Russia and China, that is reduction of a military uh, activity around the peninsula and normalization of uh, inter-Korean relations and uh, relations between uh, DPRK and the United States and uh, discussion of the whole range of uh, existing challenges. We are satisfied to say that we have uh, uh, finished phase one and now we are in the beginning of phase two. And uh, this is uh, probably the biggest news uh, in the uh, field of uh, Korean Peninsula uh, issues. Uh, there's another news. Uh, we have been able to uh, create a good constructive collaboration between all uh, parties of the negotiation process without any exceptions. And that uh, gives us a chance to uh, influence each other, understand uh, each other and our positions, and this open uh, partnership will allow us uh, in phase three to uh, work better and avoid some mistakes that uh, we have made earlier when we had multilateral talks. Uh, the assessment of the current uh, state of the situation would not be uh, objective enough if I only talked about uh, the positive things. Uh, there are some challenges too, and the biggest challenge is that uh, there's been no new significant agreements um, lately, and uh, definitely there are issues associated with implementing 
those agreements that have already been reached. Uh, that uh, could exhaust the patience of the stakeholders and that could uh, undermine uh, the uh, right uh, attitude uh, and appetite uh, for further negotiations. Uh, we uh, should avoid uh, the uh, tactics of uh, threatening because this could bring us to the uh, bridge of uh, uh, catastrophe. We understand that there is no alternative to negotiations. At the same time, uh, let me say that uh, the reasons why uh, parties are beginning to uh, feel disappointment uh, through lack of progress are quite clear. Uh, after uh, the first contacts were established uh, when uh, the uh, main statements were made, a new phase should begin uh, when uh, parties uh, switch uh, from uh, talking to acting. We have not been witnessing that so far. I think this is happening because the participants uh, of negotiations cannot decide uh, what should be the first practical steps uh, to uh, meet each other's uh, expectations. Uh, now I'm trying to answer the question, what's next? Uh, we should see initiatives that uh, could outline the practical direction of uh, work in multilateral format. Why I'm saying multilateral format, because this is uh, going to help uh, all parties to uh, avoid making the first significant step. Multilateral format gives confidence that uh, the agreements, uh, when and if uh, they are reached, uh, shall be fulfilled. Uh, following this logic, uh, together with our uh, Chinese partners uh, developing uh, the uh, 2017 roadmap, we have uh, developed a new document, a plan of actions for comprehensive settlement of uh, Korean Peninsula uh, problems. Uh, it's a comprehensive uh, plan because there are other problems uh, on top of the nuclear political humanitarian uh, economic. Uh, we. Uh, have tasks in all those uh, fields and we should address them in parallel. We uh, realize that practical implementation will be phased. Uh, we will be uh, using a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, we will be using different formats uh, with uh, different rates uh, of uh, progress, but uh, we have one big goal, to have a strong peace and uh, collective security in Northeast Asia. Uh, we have uh, lately been talking about this plan of actions a lot uh, with our colleagues uh, from China, with uh, representatives of uh, ROK, um, and uh, we appreciate uh, all the comments uh, that uh, we have received. Uh, generally, the comments have been positive. In the light of uh, these discussions, we have uh, issued a new revision of the plan, uh, which reflects uh, the uh, common denominator in all the plans. We hope that in uh, further consultations, we are going to be decided what has to happen next. In conclusion of my initial statement, I want to say that the situation around the Korean Peninsula can only go in one direction, that is continuation of negotiations. Russia is doing uh, all uh, that we can do. We are convinced uh, that our partners are working towards the same goal uh, to uh, avoid a negative development uh, because it is simply unacceptable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, and uh, next, I want to pass the floor uh, to uh, the president of uh, Institute for American Studies, uh, Mr. Uh, Yo Cho Tzu. Uh, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Mr. Anton and also the colleagues from the Center for Energy and Society Studies, as well as those from the Foreign Ministry of Russia for having kindly invited us to this important conference and also affording us warm hospitality. I do hope that this conference will produce a desired result and serve as a meaningful occasion in striking out a fundamental solution to the issue on the Korean Peninsula. With this, I'd like to mention about the current development on the Korean Peninsula and the DPRK's stand towards the key to ensuring peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in the region. 
The DPRK U.S. summit held in Singapore on June 12th last year was a historic event of important milestone in ensuring durable peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in the region by improving the DPRK-U.S. relations and fundamentally resolving the issue on the Korean Peninsula. In the following DPRK-U.S. summit meeting and talks in Hanoi and at Panmunjom, the two sides agreed to overcome inevitable hardships and difficulties which we may counter along the road of writing a new history of DPRK-U.S. relations and to resume and promote productive dialogues for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and radical development of the DPRK-U.S. relations. The three rounds of the DPRK-U.S. summit meetings and talks, which were held in less than one year, served as a historic occasion that clarified the political wills of the supreme leaders of the two countries to put an end to the bilateral hostile relations and bring peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. And we, on our part, have done in good faith to put into practice the spirit of the DPRK US and to build up trust between the two countries. I don't want to reiterate what has been done as uh, just before the uh, Vice Foreign Minister just mentioned, so I, I'm going to skip uh, some of those things. And the international community extended a strong support and encouragement to this and hoped that the lasting peace and stability would be settled on the Korean Peninsula, keeping in mind that the follow-up follow -up actions and corresponding measures from the United States would bring about the positive results in improving the DPRK-US relations. But the result proved that the United States is only attached to using our important trust-building measures to court publicity and the international community and within the, U within the US. And it only remains persistent in its hostile policy towards the DPRK and commit acts of disrupting trust. The typical example of this is the joint military exercise that the U.S. staged defiantly in collusion with South Korea. Nothing can cover up the offensive measure of the nature of the joint military exercise as it constitutes a constant course of tension on the Korean Peninsula and in the region. It is an offensive drill for nuclear war with massive commitment of the <coughs> strategic assets on and around the Korean Peninsula. And it's also an extremely dangerous war gamble in which a minor calculation or misjudgment might lead up to uncontrollable circumstances. For such reasons, even President Trump on several occasions described this joint military exercise as a war game and committed once again to its suspension at the Panmunjom summit. However, shortly after the Panmunjom summit, the United States staged yet another joint military exercise with South Korea under the pretext of defense, in defiance, defiance of the desire and aspiration of the international community. We have warned time and again that the joint military exercise is targeted at the DPRK and a violation of the spirit of the DPRK-US summit and that its conduct will have effects on the DPRK-US working level talks. In addition to this, the American foreign policy chief openly made remarks that if the DPRK does not set out to denuclearize itself, the U.S. will maintain the toughest sanctions in history to let us understand that the denuclearization is the right way. This is just a piece of hostile remarks that came against the DPRK from the American politicians subsequent to, subsequent to the DPRK-U.S. summit meeting at Panmunjom. Such behavior of the U.S. made us harbor doubts as to whether it truly does have a political will to improve 
the bilateral relations This notwithstanding, we decided to have the working level talk since the column with hope and optimism that the United States side would have had time enough to think and act in a proper way, as we had been repeatedly requested by those in the United States who were involved in diplomacy with the DPRK to open working level talks sending us repetitive signals that they are prepared for dialogue based on a new method and creative solution. However, the working level negotiations held in Stockholm showed that the United States misjudged our self-restraint and tolerance and is merely trying to play for time by subordinating the DPRK-US dialogue to its partisan interests. I make it once again clear that the political circle in Washington and anti-DPRK policy makers in the United States administration are totally responsible for the breakup of the working level negotiation uh, in Stockholm, who only sought their political objectives of using DPRK-US dialogue in favor of their domestic political agenda, and who are still hostile towards us for no reason, still being caught up in the Cold War thinking and ideological prejudice, far from the President Trump's political judgment and intentions. On the other end, concerning the results of the DPRK-US working level negotiations, there are some assertions coming out of the US that the DPRK clearly wants a lifting of sanctions and therefore the US should not change its method of calculation. We do not feel a necessity to respond case by case to all such assertions that flow from the complete lack of knowledge about the DPRK. But I have to point out one thing here. Though that the US still regards sanctions and pressure against the DPRK as a key or sort of leverage for solution of the issues. Sanctions must be definitely withdrawn as they themselves are an intolerable result, uh, sorry, intolerable insult to our state and infringement upon our sovereignty and the interests of our people. The true purpose behind the desperate pursuit by the United States of anti-DPRK sanctions and pressure doesn't merely lie in a peaceful pressure for denuclearization, but in its attempt to obliterate the very rights to existence and development of our state and people who desire to live and develop in independently. And these are all stemming from the conceptual and ideological hostility towards the DPRK. As our chairman of the State Affairs Commission has currently stated, the sufferings imposed upon the, our people by the hostile forces no longer count as sufferings and they've now turned into our people's indignation. That indignation is not simply an indignation that uh, over the sanctions, but it's a manifestation of anti-US public perceptions of, of our people to make the U.S. pay a heavy price once and for all for its infliction of immeasurable sufferings and misfortunes on our nation. We do not live now our expanded life due to sanctions, but it is well within our capability to live well off and develop by dint of self-reliance and self-development, even under the present, present conditions. We will continue to carve out our way forward 
on our own efforts with the great spirit of self-reliance, even in the face of further increased attempt by hostile forces to strangle us with the chains of sanctions and pressure and isolate and stifle us in a more cunning and heinous method. As we've already stated, the future developments on the Korean Peninsula and the basic ways for addressing the problem depend on the determination of the United States to make a clean break from its anti-DPRK hostile policy in a complete and irrevocable irre manner. The DPRK US relations are now maintained purely by the personal relations formulated between the supreme leaders of the DPRK and the United States. But the policy on the United States by our state is bound to reflect the public sentiment. In case of antagonism of our people towards the, DP, uh, to, towards the United States explodes, no one would predict how dramatically the situation on the Korean Peninsula will turn out. Viewed from uh, an objective point, I can say that there hasn't been any political progress in relations between the DPRK and the United States. And if the United States does not take practical measures to withdraw its anti-DPRK policy, hostile policy, but uh, instead plays all sorts of tricks to the last, that will prove to be the biggest mistake. And the future developments on the Korean Peninsula would entirely depend <laughs> on the choice of the United States. I thank you. Thank you, President George Al Su. Our next speaker is Kent Hurstedt, Special Envoy for the Korean Peninsula of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. As I'm sure all of you well know, Ambassador Hurstedt was the person who was actively involved in making the Stockholm, recent Stockholm meeting possible. Ambassador, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Moscow and um, also to have this, uh, to participate in this um, important conference. Um, let me first say that <clears throat> we who have, and I know here's many in this room who have been uh, engaged and working with uh, the Korean Peninsula for a very long time. We have a very long perspective on, on, the, on, uh, on decades and decades of lost opportunities to move forward. Now, I think since 2017, uh, we can still remember it was a very special year. It was uh, fire and fury speech in the United Nations by President Trump. And amongst others, my prime minister, my foreign minister went out and criticized that speech. But we also criticized nuclear tests by the DPRK. And we saw a very threatening situation appear. And uh, it was at that time uh, my government decided that we needed to try to reach out and do something out of the trust that we have uh, accumulated over decades of close cooperation with DPRK. We were the first Western country to, to recognize DPRK and the first Western country to open an embassy in DPRK. But we also worked a lot in, uh, during the Korean War. We opened a field hospital that treated more than two million patients. It was the longest lasting international hospital that was there but we also have um, a variety of other engagement on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are one of the top donors of humanitarian aid, and um, we um, have a, a lot of exchanges with DPRK on political level, uh, delegations, etc. However, we also have very close relations with the United States, and we, um, we are, um, as it's called, protective power for the United States and, and represents them when it comes to consular matters. And um, we, um, we have 
been working quite intensely from time to time, not just with the United States, but also for Canada and Australia. We feel we have a very good dialogue with Pyongyang, and we feel we can have a, a good exchanges of views, we have a working relationship, and we also, from time to time, try to, to um, put forward perspectives which we think might be unfairly treated. For example, uh, the abilities to, to um, uh, the process of getting exemptions for humanitarian work uh, in Security Council, for example. So we try um, to be engaged in a variety of matters. If we look at what's happened since 2017 until now, it's a, it's a very big change, of course. And it's, it's because of the bravery that this journey started, the bravery by Chairman Kim Jong-un, but also the bravery of Trump to change in their both political contexts um, something that have just been going on and on and on. And of course, uh, if we um, remember the 1st of January speech by Chairman Kim Jong-un last year, and later the summit in, in Singapore, but also the decision by DPRK to go to the Olympics in, in South Korea, which is also was an important message of, of reach out and, and peace. I think we, we have seen a lot of things happening during 2018 and 2019. Um, of course, when this process starts, uh, there's a lot of expectations that things will move quite, uh, uh, quite fast. But we are trying to, to move from a situation of total distrust and even hatred and demonizing. I have traveled to, to uh, DPRK for like almost soon 25 years. But I have seen how just in the last couple of years, a total change. Posters and criticizing the United States totally disappeared from all uh, arenas. There's no more posters against the United States. So you can see a, a very big change of, 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 of symbolizing and other things in uh, the DPRK society. On the other hand, also the United States have tried to, in various ways, to engage with DPRK. I'm trying to stay, stand outside the fire line between the US and, and DPRK and really try to look at objectively from the side. We have a constructive engagement by Russia and China, who have just been illustrated by the speech by Vice Minister here, who is trying to stimulate this process by their joint work with Roadmap. We have uh, uh, President Moon in, in South Korea, who, who in various ways have done outreach. But I also know amongst the friends in, in Pyongyang uh, that they also, are, from their perspective, is trying to, 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 um, to reach out. Uh, let me come to um, the meeting in Stockholm a few weeks ago. As hosts and as we consider ourselves as honest brokers, we are not saying anything about the conclusions drawn by Pyongyang. It's up to them to conclude what, the, what their expectations were, what they conclude uh, of the talks. We have nothing to say about that. That is the, the sole respect for what they have concluded. We are not saying anything about what the United States landed in as conclusions. But a few things I can say. I, th I think it was a good meeting. Yes, it didn't lead to the result desired by the capitals. Definitely, Pyongyang was very, very disappointed by the outcome. And we respect that. But they had several, several of hours of talk with each other. And that is very, very important. They had hours and hours of opportunities to express their views to each other. And they might not like what the others are saying. They might not like the conclusions. But they are learning something about each other. And it took place in a peaceful environment. Of course, we were not present because this was between the two sides. So we were not there. But I know they respected each other. And they were sitting peacefully and talking to each other for 
longer time than ex expected. So it continued a little bit longer than expected, an hour or an hour and a half longer. So I think this was well invested. Um, yes, you can conclude and say it, it was a, a failure, as Pyongyang is saying. I respect their conclusion. Or you could say, as the US said, that this was a good meeting, and I respect their conclusion. But what is needed now is that we don't miss any time, because this is a historic window in time. Uh, the political calendar is running. There will be elections in South Korea in April. There might be changes in the political uh, situation in South Korea that might undermine uh, this kind of direction, leading in the direction of more skepticism. We have in November presidential elections in the United States. Who knows if the next president will be the same or someone else. And since I'm a former politician for a long time, I know that sometimes when you change government, you also change political directions. So it's very important that we do not miss this opportunity. I know also on the DPRK side, there is brave people uh, there who are re willing to give this a chance. But uh, I think it's very important that we don't come to the end of this year with no more progress, because I think both sides need some kind of progress. And we have all heard about the end of the year as a very important uh, timing. And um, there's no time to waste. I think new meetings are needed, and every time they meet, they will learn more about each other and maybe get closer to an agreement about something. Maybe we cannot expect the biggest achievement immediately, but maybe they can harvest the low-hanging fruits and go from there and then move upwards to the more and more difficult issues. But I think it, it, it's quite important, and I know we all, uh, China, Russia, Sweden, South Korea, other, are encouraging more of talks, because that is the only way. So by that I want to conclude by saying I'm cautiously optimistic, because when I meet the people from the US and I meet the people from DPRK, and uh, I visit these capitals uh, frequently, uh, I know that there is a desire for peace, I know that there is people on both sides who are uh, serious, sincere, but also people with real power on both sides that are willing to, to, to be brave. Uh, but we just need to continue to, to encourage this. Finally, I want to say something about negotiations. It is not just that five people meets five people. It's not as simple as that. It also is a matter of mandate. It's a matter of understanding each other's culture of negotiating. It's about expectations on negotiations and many, many more questions. So a meeting do not necessarily have to be a success just because that uh, equal numbers are meeting, but they need to get to know each other to be able also to do agreements about very sensitive matters. And for DPRK, this is a matter of national security, of course, at the highest level, and that's why it's so difficult and so sensitive for them. So we have to continue to encourage, and of course, in the end of this road, it needs a multi, uh, 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 um, uh, that all relevant parties should be involved in the end solution to, the, to, this, uh, to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Harstedt. And when we were planning, planning this session, I thought that it could be very helpful to have a think tank community representative on the panel uh, who has less restrictions <laughs> and who is more flexible uh, 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 what he or she could sa say. And uh, this is why, Susan, I appreciate very much that you agreed to join this panel. I would not list all professional heads which Susan have <laughs> or will have very soon. We'll mention just one. She's Senior Fellow of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Susan, the floor is yours. 
that's quite an introduction, Anton. I, <laughs> expectations are raised. Let me thank CNES and, of course, the Russian Foreign Ministry for hosting this meeting. I'm happy to be back here in Moscow. Given the title of the panel, I'll divide my remarks into two parts. First, what's new, and then what's next. Uh, so in terms of what's new, I want to focus on two important developments that I think could help move U.S. DPRK diplomacy forward. The first is Steve Began's nomination as U.S. Deputy Secretary of State. If he is confirmed by the U.S. Senate, and there's every expectation that he will be, he will continue his role as President Trump's envoy for North Korea. This senior position, combined with continuity on the North Korea portfolio, demonstrates a commitment to sustaining diplomatic process with Pyongyang. The second development is what I would describe as movement towards a new approach by the U.S., which includes some flexibility on calibrated sanctions relief combined with the implementation on an action-for-action -action basis. This new approach, which was discussed uh, recently in the U.S.-North Korea talks in Stockholm, <coughs> Um, would allow negotiations to continue as agreements are executed. My own assessment uh, is to read this as an answer to North Korea's request for a new calculation model. Both of these developments should present a favorable context for peaceful, and, um, peaceful engagement and diplomacy. So moving on to what's next. Clearly, leader-to-leader -leader engagement was a bold move to forge a new kind of relationship after decades of hostility between the United States and North Korea. Both countries have, to their credit, demonstrated that they need to sit down with a long-standing adversary at the highest level, clearing a path for diplomacy. Although tensions remain largely under control, Excuse me. We must acknowledge that there has been very little progress between the United States and North Korea since the Hanoi summit, which was held nearly nine months ago. In fact, the North Koreans have continued to advance their capabilities throughout this period. Also, the one area of progress since the Singapore summit, which took place nearly a year and a half ago, cooperation on the return of U.S. remains, has been halted. So it's clear that we've hit uh, a clear, um, a hard impasse, is what I would call it. So I'd like to propose three ways, if taken together, could possibly help break this impasse. First, continuing the twin suspension of major U.S. ROK military exercises and North Korea's long-range uh, missile tests and nuclear tests is keeping the door open for diplomacy. Maintaining a constructive atmosphere for engagement is critical to preventing tensions from rising again. Uh, second are communications channels. The difficulty in sustaining communication is a chronic problem that we're facing, and it must be addressed. If we are going to have any chance for progress, it is essential for Washington and Pyongyang to reach agreement on the establishment of a direct channel that would enable steady and reliable communications as a priority. As much as we love, Kent, what you're doing, we think you need a break. Um, <laughs> there should be further agreement to maintain this channel, not only through relatively good times, but also through the tougher times. In fact, I would emphasize during these periods, it's even more important. This requires commitment. Uh, I think opening a li U.S. liaison office in Pyongyang, which was a point of discussion in Hanoi, would be a, a significant step towards addressing this communications problem. The third point is working level meetings. And the summits between Mr. Kim and Mr. Trump certainly symbolize a major breakthrough in relations. But they also have revealed the limits of what I would call personality-driven diplomacy when it's not backed up by working-level talks. Simply put, the formulation and execution of a coherent strategy beyond the summary <coughs> has been missing. Uh, the lack of concrete progress is expected uh, given the deep mistrust that exists. 
uh, and the complexities of the issues on the table. But even so, we should be somewhat concerned that after one and a half years since Singapore, the fundamentals required to carry out a productive diplomatic process remain unsettled. A key lesson I think we should learn from Singapore and Hanoi is that a limited flurry of engagement in the lead up to summits isn't going to bring about successful outcomes. It simply won't work. Seven months have elapsed between the Hanoi summit and the recent talks in Stockholm on October 5th. By my count, since becoming US Special Representative for North Korea, nearly a year and a half ago, Steve Began has only been in meetings with his North Korean counterparts for a total of seven days. This is clearly insufficient for making any progress. And my own point of view is that before another summit can happen, an agreement or a near agreement should be already worked out. Uh, there is only one way to get there, and that is to meet and to meet often. Uh, I should add that in the political current um, atmosphere in Washington, there is broad agreement that demonstrated concrete progress should precede another summit level interaction. So for working level talks to be productive, it's clear both sides need to adjust. In Hanoi, the US insisted that the North Koreans fully denuclearize before receiving any concessions. My understanding is that now the North Koreans are insisting that the US meet all of their demands before they do anything on disarmament, let alone denuclearization. Both are unproductive and untenable positions. And in order to break the stalemate, both sides need to adjust their positions. We need to find a middle way. We need to focus on achievable goals, incremental benchmarks, and action for action approach. So here's the quandary we face. It's simply unrealistic to expect the United States to make key concessions absence of demonstrated commitment on North Korea's part to make progress on disarming. At the same time, it's also unrealistic to expect Kim Jong-un to agree to an approach that provides no assurances to safeguard his regime and no opportunities to address economic challenges early in the process. So it's clear now we need sustained talks, drawing on the principles hammered out in the Singapore de uh, Declaration to manage the uncertainties ahead and resolve a range of difficult issues. So let me just conclude. I think it would be remiss if I didn't point out the serious challenges ahead. First, the political environment in the United States that Kent has already mentioned. President Trump is facing an impeachment process. He's also in the midst of a re-election campaign. The outcomes of both, of course, are unknown, adding an element of uncertainty to an already complicated picture. Second, uh, Pyongyang's declared end-of-year deadline for progress is looming very large. It's unclear whether this is a tactical move to get a better negotiating position or if it reflects a strategic decision to change course. This also adds an element of um, uncertainty, and I hope that the US administration is taking this deadline very seriously. This brings me to the important element of timing. We should avoid running the risk of missing the window of opportunity before us that soon may close. I should mention that in the United States, um, the American people strongly support the engagement. A recent poll uh, said that nearly 70% of Americans support negotiating a peace agreement with North Korea. Um, this is uh, fantastic public support, but it could be fleeting. And I think Pyongyang should realize that as it continues to advance its capabilities, the tide could change very quickly. Um, I think we have to come to grips that the US and North Korea are really at a pre-negotiation stage. And given the still tenuous communication channels and the high stakes for both leaders, we could slip back to a ratcheting of hostilities very quickly, with both sides returning to a mutually reinforcing escalation of tensions including perhaps once again spiraling toward a military confrontation, either by design or by miscalculation. So it is in North Korea's and the US's uh, interest not to return to the crisis-like situation of 2017's fire and fury, 
Uh, restraint needs to be exercised. Cool heads need to uh, prevail. So what we are talking about is changing the fundamental nature of this relationship. This takes time. We have to recognize that. We need to demonstrate a commitment to sticking with a very difficult process over and over again. And we need vigorous diplomacy to test each other's intentions, shape an outcome towards a less contentious relationship, and make the progress that both sides want to see happen. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. We have about 40 minutes for questions and comments. But the first question will be asked by my co-chair, Li Chiang. Please, Chiang. Uh, thank you, Anto. And uh, thank you for the, all the panelists uh, for their excellent evaluation of the current uh, situation and the next uh, prospect of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, as all the panelists have to some extent mentioned the dif difficulties and positive momentums concerning the top level dialogues and also the working level dialogues. I just uh, wondering uh, whether what is the most pressing challenges when if we wish to continue such kind of positive momentum of continue the dialogue and promoting a peaceful solution of the uh, Korean Peninsula. So maybe I will start from reverse uh, order from the Susan, please. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good question. There are so many answers to that question, but let me focus on one. One, one, yeah. Uh, when I was here for the dialogue for this conference two years ago, um, I was also on the North Korea panel, and I made the suggestion of the U.S. and North Koreans should engage in talks about talks before negotiations begin, similar to how the U.S.-Iran dialogue proceeded. There was a long period where there were discussions on what the objectives were, what the red lines were, what are the, uh, what's the roadmap to get there. And it seems like we still have not had that discussion with North Korea. So uh, I think stepping back and doing that um, now uh, would be a good thing to do to clarify what each other's intentions are and how they think this should go. I think we need to have that discussion ur urgently. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ambassador. Um, <clears throat> there's many things most pressing, actually, but, but one thing I think is more urgent than other things, and that is uh, to be able to achieve some kind of progress before the end of the year. It's both, uh, it would both give something to Chairman Kim Jong-un, it will also give something to President Trump, uh, it will give something to the trust of the process. Because if you can start to see some, some progress, some steps forward, then that means that this will not be too easy to change for a potentially other government in the United States. Because if they see that this is leading forward, I think a new administration potentially would like to continue then. But if, if it ends in an election year with no progress, then maybe someone else, if that would happen, would then say this is a wrong direction. So I think for the process as such, both sides would like and need some kind of success in negotiations, and that is very soon. I think it would be most helpful for both sides. Uh, it would also be for the DPRK side that they could see that this could actually lead to some constructive steps forward, and it would generate more time, and maybe uh, then that looming deadline, whatever it will mean on the other side of the year, uh, would be able to, to uh, take this into account, that the, the negotiations can lead to progress. So I think it's well needed on both sides to have some, some kind of uh, progress, and that's very soon. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, President Joe, please. Uh, thank you. I think there are many things that we can uh, just put on the table to discuss, but I'd like to highlight that the, the distrust, I mean the mistrust between the DPRK and the US is really deep-rooted and therefore 
the confidence building measures are fundamental in order to build a trust and also in order to to respect each other and uh, as regards uh, the actions taken by the DPRK side, we've already uh, put a moratorium to the nuclear testing and also the, we've dismantled the testing, nuclear testing site as well in order to show in action our the will to to go through in the direction of what was agreed in the summit in in, in Singapore last year, and then therefore we have been asking the United States to come to us with kind of corresponding measures, and as many of the participants here know what has been going on, and I don't want to. Uh, describe uh, too too long. So we have been from outside. We have been doing our uh, best in order to to show our willingness and to show our will to move forward. But it's not at a unilateral. Uh, unilaterally, it can it's it cannot be unilaterally solved. We should be also uh, receiving the 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 kind of response from the United States side at the same level, which will uh, give us confidence as well. So we have been asking that. Just show us whatever you uh, your your just prove your words with your actions, and those should be mutually acceptable. And of course, there has been a discrepancy between the two sides, and therefore we do think that there is a still a long way to go. But uh, I'd like to to say that. As we've already given the time to the United States, uh, which are, uh, Ms. Susan has just mentioned, until the end of the year, and we, we, we are waiting with patience. And of course, we hope that everything will go in a positive direction, but, but I'd like to say that window of opportunity is closing day by day. Thank you. Thank you, President Joe. I tend to agree uh, with uh, our colleague from uh, DPRK. Lack of trust is the biggest problem uh, that uh, we are uh, witnessing between the uh, parties to the negotiations uh, to overcome this lack of trust. People need to talk. Negotiations are needed, and that's uh, what uh, the panelists have said in the first round. Uh, it takes patience. Uh, it uh, uh, takes positive attitudes uh, to develop trust uh, step by step. In uh, longer term, I think there is yet another uh, difficulty. Uh, we all welcomed uh, the beginning of negotiations between the United States and uh, DPRK, but uh, all problems on the Korean Peninsula cannot be solved uh, in a bilateral format. So sooner or later, we will uh, see the need uh, for other countries of this region, or rather some region, uh, to uh, join negotiations. A bilateral format can not solve all the problems in Northeast Asia and on the Korean Peninsula. So there, uh, too, we are going to face some objective uh, challenges, and all uh, countries in the sub-region uh, should 
have the will and the ability to overcome this. Now we have time for questions. Please be very brief, one minute each, so we can take, I think, five or six questions, and after that we'll give the floor to all panelists uh, to respond. Melissa, so, please, please microphone the first, and then Dr. Varansov. <laughs> Melissa Hammond. Thank you very much for your very honest and, and difficult answers to a, a difficult situation. I wondered, given the narrowing time window before the end of your deadline, and all the political pressures in domestic politics that are also affecting the issue, how can civil society, how can non-governmental organizations best support continued improving security relationship on the peninsula, either through dialogue, institutional memory, or um, uh, verification measures that can assist? Dr. Warrensoff is next. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you to uh, all the panelists of uh, this uh, bright discussion. Thank you for your analysis of the situation. Uh, what has to be done? Uh, I think the answer is obvious. Uh, in uh, negotiations between the U.S. and uh, uh, DPRK and in other formats, we see one challenge, lack of practical steps. Uh, the declarations and uh, goodwill has, have been made and has been shown. Uh, that uh, has been done. And uh, uh, our uh, friends uh, from DPRK uh, repeat time and again. Uh, nice smiles, nice uh, promises have been accepted. Uh, the time for that has passed. Now it's time uh, to take uh, reciprocal uh, steps. Is there political will in the United States and in the Republic of Korea uh, to uh, switch to practical steps uh, and development of practical uh, cooperation, lifting of sanctions, uh, starting economic uh, cooperation between uh, the two Korean states. Uh, there is uh, time till the end of the year. Uh, the window is becoming more and more narrow. So it's uh, quite obvious. Is there the will out there to uh, start making political steps? So the, uh, first of all, thank all of you. I feel a little more optimistic now than I did one hour ago <laughs> coming in here. Uh, the question I have for President uh, Cho uh, is what, what is DPRK's uh, current position uh, on the will to retain a civilian nuclear power program in eventual denuclearization? And if it does want to retain a civilian nuclear power program, how is that consistent with the offer that was made at Hanoi uh, to dismantle all of the young beyond nuclear complex? Tari Krauf next, and then we'll give the panel a chance to respond, and hopefully we'll have time for another round. Tari, please. A question to Dr. Joe. You mentioned that the DPRK had dismantled its Fungiri nuclear test site, and I was wondering whether as a confidence-building measure, the DPRK could invite the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization to pay a visit uh, to comment on the closure of the test site, and to Ambassador Hustedt, the breakthroughs in the Chemical Weapons Convention and in the uh, INF Treaty were made at the higher level by Foreign Ministers Schultz and Shevardnadze. And my former boss, Director General Albara, they said, if you give this to the plumbers, they spoil the thing. So we need architects. So should there not be another round at the leader level to come to a high level agreement and then one can write it up rather than get back into the lower level? Thank you. So we'll give the first uh, floor to Ambassador Hurstead to respond, then to <coughs> President George uh, Su, and then Susan DiMaggio and Deputy Foreign Minister Margulov, if they would like to react. Thank you so much for that question. Um, 
that's one question we have been reflecting on all, all of us who are involved in one way or the other. There has been an enormous amount of, of uh, summits on top level. I think there's been 15 summits, if you include with uh, Trump, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Moon, and uh, Putin. Uh, and uh, I think um, um, what we are looking at that might be the next step is, no, let's say like this. What, what is needed is that they prepare for the summit so that they can harvest on the summits. That's why it's been so important that, that working level meetings can be successful so that the top leaders can meet and maybe conclude some of the most important or, or details and, and also sign agreements, etc. So I think working level meetings are important both to prepare for summits but also to follow up summits. And I don't expect that there will be, I, I think we will go into a period of maybe summit fatigue because I don't expect there will be such intensity in summits as we have seen this last one and a half year. So yes, I believe in, in, in summits for top leaders to meet from time to time, but there needs to happen things in between these summits to follow up what the leaders say, but also prepare for the leaders to make agreements. Uh, there are certain things that only can be discussed amongst the, the top leaders. But maybe next step could be, uh, we just heard uh, uh, Dimaggio just mentioning about the promotion of of the, the special representative of the United States to become uh, number two in foreign policy on behalf of the United States. That will put him in equal position to, to his more or less counterpart on the, on the DPRK side, Madam Chair, uh, who many of us know. So maybe that could be a potential high level uh, talk between the two sides that could be uh, quite realistic um, uh, also. But of course, it's up to the two sides to decide that. Uh, this is uh, something we can encourage. But um, so yes, it needs to be on a decently high level to be able to, to have constructive uh, negotiations. I agree with you there. But maybe not every time on the highest level, because their me need, meetings need to be prepared, and they need to be followed up. This is my opinion. President Jochelsu. Uh, first of all, let, let me respond to, to to Mr. Hacker's question with respect to the civil nuclear energy. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Whether you plan to uh, continue use an, uh, mm. peaceful uh, use of How this one uh, matches with what we do. I think this issue should be further discussed afterwards. Of course, uh, our, as just just mentioned, and we we are. I've already committed to, to the dismantling of some nuclear facilities, but you know, in, in practice, uh, nothing has been completed. And uh, as I've just mentioned, up to this date, what has been done from outside is the moratorium to nuclear testing plus the dismantling of the, the nuclear t t testing site. So uh, whenever uh, there is a progress through discussions. I think everything can be put on the table and everything can be settled to, uh, to the interests of the, the both sides. And with respect to the, the visit to the Pungeri site by the CTBTO or experts, uh, I'd like to say that this action has been taken unilaterally by us and we haven't, uh, as I just mentioned, received any kind of positive response to, to this. So I can say that this one should be also further discussed afterwards. But uh, I'd like to say that everything can be positively considered for sure. Thank you. Susan, would you like to react? Yes, just briefly. I, I like the idea of a meeting between 
uh, Deputy Secretary of State Began and his counterpart, Ms. Che, preferably in Pyongyang. So please can't set that up right away. <laughs> and um, I think in terms of the concrete steps, Ambassador Voronsov, I completely agree with you. And I think that um, the elements of a potential interim deal were left on the table in Hanoi, and we should revisit them. Um, as I said, I think the administration is now ready to move forward with a more incremental approach, including some sanctions relief. I wish they had done it sooner, but here we are, and I think it's an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, so I would uh, proceed on that basis. I uh, support what uh, Susan said and what Dr. Voronsov said. Uh, we need practical steps. Uh, this is very important. Uh, uh, DPRK has uh, taken uh, some uh, steps. We know about it, and uh, they have been uh, voiced today. It's clear that our uh, North Korean partners uh, expect uh, the uh, same actions on the American side. Uh, this uh, is the logic uh, uh, that uh, is behind uh, our efforts to develop a plan of actions. We uh, want to come up with a list of practical steps uh, that parties uh, could make on this journey. Uh, we have shared this uh, plan with the United States and with uh, DPRK. This is not uh, a final document. This is a very uh, flexible set of proposals. This is a menu that one can choose from. Various steps, various measures, whatever uh, countries uh, think uh, may be possible. These measures don't have to be big. Uh, they. Uh, do not have to uh, dismantle uh, some facilities or uh, make uh, other uh, big uh, steps or concessions. We could uh, look into some uh, symbolic actions. Uh, we, again, have to revisit the issue of lack of trust. We need to demonstrate the willingness uh, to continue uh, negotiations and to increase the potential of trust. All right, first. Today, international community has uh, two uh, instruments uh, that it can use uh, to affect uh, the situation in Korea, sanctions and negotiations. Uh, the third uh, option, uh, the military uh, solution, is generally recognized as impossible. Uh, in the political process, uh, there are two parties involved, uh, DPRK and the United States. Uh, other parties can uh, uh, check in later. Uh, sanctions are international, but it uh, turns out uh, that sanctions are used uh, for the interests of the United States. And uh, uh, DPRK is on the receiving end of the sanctions. I think that uh, other international uh, bodies uh, could uh, play a bigger role with regard to sanctions. I have a question uh, for uh, Mr. Morgulov and for uh, Mr. Uh, Cho. Uh, what could Russia uh, do uh, to uh, modify, to change uh, the uh, sanctions regime? Thank you, Anton, very much. Trevor Finlay from the University of Melbourne. Uh, none of the panelists have yet talked about verification. And sometimes you hear that, well, talk of verification is premature until we know the scope and the details of what's being agreed. But to my mind, as we've seen in the past agreements, verification really needs to be woven into uh, the ultimate uh, result. So I'd appreciate some comments from any of the panel about uh, when we should start to get into the details of verification and how that should be related to the scope of the agreement. Thank you. Dr. Tan, next one. Uh, thank you. I'm Tung Jianqi from China Institute of International Studies, China. Uh, almost all our four panelists mentioned the mistrust between DPRK and the United States. And according to the experience of uh, Jesse POA, 
I think uh, I'm not sure our uh, DPRG colleague and our uh, US uh, colleague uh, are willing to have a third party in such a you know a direct uh, meeting uh, between the two sides to bridge the big gap of mistrust at this moment since we are you know approaching the close of the, uh, the window of opportunity thank you i think it's time to give the floor to the panelists but i do have the two very final hands uh, uh, noah and then richard johnson please сюда в микрофон принесите пожалуйста на второй ряд Thank you very much. Uh, as Ms. Tamangio pointed out during her initial remarks, two years ago during this conference we heard about fire and fury, and today we have heard that the situation is uh, relatively improved from, from that time. So my question to Mr. Cho is, if Mr. Trump is not re-elected in uh, 2020, um, are there conversations about what will happen to the deal as it stands right now or to the negotiations? Uh, and if so, what is the nature of those discussions? Thank you very much. Richard Johnson, the, the final question for this panel. Thank you very much for this excellent panel. Um, we understand from press reports that possibly the United States continues to be very focused. I'm sorry, I'm Richard Johnson with the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, the United States continues to be interested in a roadmap or a final end state uh, that it wishes to come up with before it gets into the details of the step-by-step -step approach. And I was wondering if the panel might comment on that or, and specifically, looking back to not reinventing the wheel and previous work we've done, what about the September 19th, 2005 joint statement as a basis for moving forward uh, on that so-called end state? Thank you. So now every panelist will have the floor and I suggest to give some extra time to President George Hertzou to prepare his remarks. So I suggest Susan, you will start first, then Ambassador Hurstead, then Deputy Foreign Minister Margulov, and then uh, uh, President George Hertzou because he was asked most of the questions. Uh, on the issue of verification, I think a good first step would be uh, what was discussed in Hanoi, the uh, codification of um, the cessation of missile and nuclear tests. Although verification wasn't discussed, that would be a good first step. It's low-hanging fruit, and it could happen rather quickly. Um, <clears throat> in terms of a third party, I think we actually have a Kent playing a bit of a third party role already. I don't know if you were thinking anything beyond that. But at the end of the day, I do think that in order to move forward in a productive way, the US and North Korea have to come to a common understanding of what it is they're doing and what their end goals are. I think very, something very similar happened with the JCPOA. Um, it was before, of course, the Europeans had been working on those negotiations for a decade. But it wasn't until the Washington and Tehran reached an understanding that the negotiations were actually able to go forward in earnest. I think it's a bit of a similar situation here. And as we've seen, unfortunately, the cooperation, which has been quite um, remarkable between Seoul and Pyongyang, has come to a standstill because of the lack of U.S. North Korea progress, which is a shame. Uh, so I think uh, that's an added incentive to get things started very quickly. Um, in terms of the final end state, uh, certainly the 2005 joint statement has a lot of the principles and key ingredients. I don't think we have to re reinvent the wheel. I, I would suspect somewhere in the bowels of the State Department all these documents exist, and then some, and we could st certainly start there. But I also think, the for the purposes of here and now, the Singapore Declaration really does include the key points. It's a little bare bones for my taste, but it does, uh, the, the North Koreans did commit to working towards denuclearization. And I think rather than getting bogged down in coming to an absolute common understanding of what that means, uh, we need to move forward and test the waters with smaller deals as we go forward. Uh, so that would be my recommendation on how to move forward. Ambassador Harrison. <clears throat> um, two, two, three things. One is that <clears throat> I want to comment a little bit more about the window closing, the window of opportunity. I, I think it's, it's important 
that the contacts between DPRK and the US when it comes to trust is broadening from just being amongst the two top leaders. It's both a strength but also a weakness. Because if, if everything is up to two leaders' direct relationship, whether this will move forward or not, then we, in winds of change, that will not be easy to, to pursue. So it's very important that this window of opportunity also means that other layers of, of trust and cooperation are established that can last over the years to come. So that's why it's so important to, to have more levels of cooperation. <clears throat> Secondly, if we are not reaching some kind of progress when it comes to negotiations in the near future, we will most likely soon be in a worse position. So that is what's looming, that we need to see some kind of progress because with all likeliness, uh, we will soon be in a worse situation. And that's why we all need to work in the same direction uh, and to try to, to encourage uh, more of, of dialogue. But it also means that both Washington and Pyongyang needs to move a little bit. Because if no one is moving, we will stay where we are. So that is also part of this process. It's not just about methods. It's not just about political will. Uh, it's not just about <clears throat> meetings. It's, it's also about to make certain, uh, uh, be willing to move a little bit. Otherwise, we will have the same result. Thank you. Igor <laughs> Vladimirovich. I uh, wanted to respond to the question uh, that uh, Mr. Talaraya brought up. Uh, the uh, sanctions regime is not uh, a, a purpose in itself. Uh, the sanctions only can not uh, give uh, any results desired by the United States. And our colleague from uh, DPRK said that uh, Russia uh, assumed that the sanctions uh, should not uh, uh, hurt uh, the people of uh, DPRK who have uh, nothing to do with uh, missile or nuclear uh, programs, and that was our assumption, and that's still uh, what uh, we are basing our decisions on. I think that sanctions against uh, DPRK have been exhausted. I I cannot imagine what uh, big restrictions or sanctions uh, can be imposed on uh, DPRK. Today, this international sanctions regime is one of the most uh, stringent. And I uh, cannot see uh, any potential uh, for maneuver with sanctions. Uh, Russia has uh, been uh, uh, standing for step-by-step uh, -step removal, lifting of uh, sanctions in the uh, course of denuclearization. And there we uh, differ uh, from some of the partners who believe that sanctions should be lifted at one time when full denuclearization uh, is achieved. We think differently. We think that the process of step-by-step -step sanctions lifting uh, should go alongside uh, with the process of declaration and the Security Council should keep revisiting uh, the issue of lifting of uh, sanctions step by step as we will be making progress in decolonization. That is our attitude and uh, I am sure that uh, it will bring a full elimination of sanctions uh, from uh, DPRK. Uh, Do you want to ask? Please. Uh, let, let me respond to to the sanctions first, as just uh, Vice Minister just mentioned, our position is clear with respect to the sanctions. Sanctions must be definitely withdrawn, as they themselves are an intolerable insult to our state and infringement on our sovereignty and the interests of the people. And uh, 
As regards those sanctions, our Russian and then Chinese colleagues on our uh, advocating on our behalf, not only on our behalf, but as just mentioned, they do realize that uh, those are, uh, are having a negative impact to the daily life of the people, and therefore the sanctions should be removed. And we do very much uh, appreciate the efforts made by our Russian and, and, and Chinese, Chinese colleagues in, in the UN fora. I, I don't want to uh, make more comments on that. As I, I've uh, just uh, made our position clear in my keynote speech. And with respect to, to the, the negotiation and, and bridging the gap between the TPRK and the United States, uh, we remain un unchanged in our position to resolve uh, the, the issues through dialogue and negotiations. That's why I uh, just mentioned that we are ready to have dialogue and have uh, negotiation with the United States. But what I think the most important is it should bear the fruits. Or if the talks are merely serving just for the, for the sake of holding talks only, I, I think it's quite meaningless. That's why we've already conveyed our position clear, and we made our position clear to the United States side. And of course, whenever there, there is a kind of a constructive and, and positive signals, then sure, we are, we are ready to, to, to meet any time. But if it is only just a mimir talk for, no. uh, and then no. if it cannot bring about kind of any tangible results, we are not interested in that kind of talks. That this is our position, and uh, we, uh, the, the third question whether, uh, if uh, I understood correctly, you, you you asked us whether our position will remain the same after the Trumps, uh, after the next year, or is that correct or what? Yes, that's mm. what he was asking. If there's a new uh, administration, mm. so how will your position play out? Whether, uh, whether President Trump will be re-elected or not, it's the, the internal issue of the United States. So I don't want to get ahead of that. But I'd like to highlight that uh, until this time on the U.S. DPRK relations have been maintained purely by the personal relations of the two supreme leaders. I think my comments That's are done. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all panelists. Please join me to thank panelists and my co-chair. I think it was very useful discussion and I hope we will have more discussions with all key players involved. And for the record, I would like to say that I hear quite often from Seoul, from Tokyo, we would like to part of the discussion. During this session, neither representative of Japan nor Republic of Korea make any suggestions. I understand that governmental officials have some uh, restrictions, but there are also some think tankers in the room. If we are serious about progress, and I think a few speakers made it clear that the door is closing, we do need creative ideas. And it's time to have a dialogue, time to generate ideas, like a few were introduced by Susan. We can agree with them, disagree, but this is the, the, uh, uh, the basis for the further discussion. We do need ideas. Uh, so please take your time during the reception, during the coffee break. <laughs> Find a way to continue the dialogue. But don't forget that this is not the final session for today because the final session is innovative for us. 
will start at 9.30 after the reception, when all much better prepared than now for, for, for the uh, resolution of quite complicated issues. So at 9.30 we will have so-called night owls debate. The topic of this session, one hour session, why do we need arms control agreements? We have two very experienced, very knowledgeable speakers, Sergei Kislyak, former Russian ambassador to the United States, former deputy foreign minister of the Russian Federation, who is with Russian Senate nowadays, and Linton Brooks, former NSA director, former START one negotiator, former submarine person, uh, and we can continue. But please be back to this conference room five minutes before the session starts, which means 9.25. Thank you again, and looking forward to see you in two hours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.